have a seat, y'all. Um, we're going to get started this morning in Romans chapter 1. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32. Romans chapter 1, 18 to 32. Do we have any readers this morning? Does anybody want to read? A long passage. Okay. And follow along as I read. I'm not sure if we actually have the passage up in front of us this morning. No. Okay. Let's go to the Word of God. Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has made it or has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is forever blessed. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those which are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, <coughs> men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Wow. This, this is the week that uh, Roy would, would go out of town, right? <laughs> what a difficult passage this is. I mean, very clear to us, I think, what Paul is saying in this passage, but probably one of the darkest passages on, on the nature of fallen man in all of Scripture. You might recall last week that uh, Roy discussed, you know, Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and to the Greek. And, and as we think about that, on the heels of the power of the gospel, Paul is telling us about the need of the gospel and the importance of the gospel. He now demonstrates in this passage why all people, both Jews and Greeks, need the gospel. Because literally we stand condemned before God. Um, see if I can get to it here. You might recall that in, in the book of John, um, Jesus says something about the nature of man that follows a very familiar passage. You're familiar with um, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But listen to what it says in John 3, 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. And then verse 18. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe, and here's the part I want you to hear, but whoever does not believe in Him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's only Son. Paul says it goes even back before that. 
But people stand before God condemned. We stand before God uh, in judgment, even now. Some people, when they look at this passage, they have sort of perceived that this is a passage about pagan nations and pagan people and Gentiles only. But Paul's going to disabuse us of that thought in the next chapter because what you'll see in chapter 2 is that the entire chapter is about how these things are true about God's people. Not just pagan nations, but about God's own people as well. You know, Judah had a long history, and Israel had a long history of idolatry and immorality. We saw that in the wilderness wandering when they're out in the wilderness with Moses. We see that in the promised land once they arrive there and begin to take on the idolatry of the nations around them. Uh, even for all the, that whole period of time prior to the exile, we see this is true of God's people. And it's something that we see Paul even warning the Corinthians about uh, in the New Testament. So this is not only true of pagan nations, it's also true of God's people as well. One of the things that, that Roy had pointed out here I think that's important is, you know, we live in a day where, where Darwinism has sort of impacted the world. And anthropology is, is the broad topic of, of the study of man. And it has changed anthropology. It's changed the view of man. Under Darwin's sort of uh, evolutionary processes, man is an evolved creature. And, and a lot of people view religion as an evolved thing as well. They think that, you know, it began with animism, and that from animism it became um, more polytheistic over time, and that idolatry began to creep in. And then what happened as things were evolving is that it got more and more focused on a primary god, though there were uh, other gods as well. Henotheism is what that is, where there's one primary god but other gods. And then to monotheism, which would be Judaism and Christianity. And so what they say is what's really going on with Christianity is you guys just have an evolved level of religion as opposed to other religions of the world. But is that what this passage teaches us? Doesn't this passage start with just the opposite of this? It starts with the fact that they knew God, that all people know God, that he's made himself known. And so it starts with, with a strict monotheism, and then it begins to degenerate from there. It's just the opposite of these processes. Um, you know, this is also a passage, I, I think, that helps us understand the importance of evangelism when we come to it as well. And that is that as, as we read about this, we realize that all men everywhere need the gospel. And hopefully it will impact us that way this morning as well, that we will understand the importance of the gospel in our lives and in the lives of others. The central idea of this passage this morning is that we need to understand that all people, even religious people, and you'll see this, I think, on the notes up behind me, are sinners without excuse and in need of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the passage lays out four reasons why. And I know that's not very Presbyterian to have four reasons. We were talking about that earlier. <laughs> but nevertheless, Roy did do the notes. So, <laughs> so I just want you to understand that that's not my fault. So, the first reason that we're given, the first reason is that people distort the original knowledge of God. People distort the original knowledge of God. Notice here in, in verse 18 as we begin this passage that he begins with the wrath of God that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Suppressing the truth. Now first of all, let's try to understand the wrath of God because that's something that is not widely understood. A lot of people believe that, that, that God's wrath might be like that of, of Greek or Roman gods, a capricious wrath, um, just an uncontrolled emotional outburst of some sort. <coughs> Um, but that's not what's going on here. God's wrath is a righteous and holy wrath. You know, even we are encouraged in Scripture to be angry and not sin. This is an anger that is a righteous anger toward sin. And in this passage, we see that it's both providential and eschatological. Uh, let me explain what that means. You know, providential in that it's being revealed. It's being meted out in our lives. And he talks in this passage about that wrath bringing about God's giving people over. And so there's a giving over process that is part of God's judgment. And I think, you know, as we, we look at our own nation right now, I think collectively of, of us as a people, there's a giving over that seem, seems to be taking place in a sense there. 
But certainly in our own lives, we understand something of what this means as well. But it's not only the judgment of God that's being sort of brought about in His providence in our daily lives now, but there is a future judgment as well. Both are talked about in Scripture. There is that, that 2 Thessalonians 1.5 day of judgment that's coming when, when the wrath of God will be poured out um, in total. And of course we know at the cross that for those who trust in Christ that the wrath of God is meted out how? It's meted out on, on Jesus. That's what the cross is all about. The gospel is necessary because of the wrath of God. It's powerfully able to deliver us, as he said last week in, in the same passage. Okay, so what's, what's kindled the wrath of God? What has brought this about? Unrighteousness? Ungodliness? Yes. Yes, but even more than that, it is the suppression of truth. Um, notice, though, with the two words, ungodliness and unrighteousness, that with ungodliness, what he's referring to there is the sins that we commit against God. Here he's looking at a more vertical relationship, and our sin is, is, not, is God not being our God, of us having other gods before him. The first two commandments, where we're not rightly related to God in our lives. But there's also the horizontal here in that we sin against one another, the unrighteousness here that he's referring to, both the vertical and horizontal sins in our lives. You know, Jesus talked about these same things. The young man approached him and he said, um, you know, Tell me, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And, and what is the greatest commandment in Scripture? And he said that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, the vertical. And what was the second? He said the second is like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <coughs> so you, you've got both of those. And Paul's addressing them here and says God's wrath is being kindled because of sin in our lives, both vertical and horizontal. But there's a specific thing here as well, and that is the suppression of truth. We'll talk about that more in just a second. But, um, you know, as, as we come into this passage, we also talk about the wrath of God being revealed because there's a culpability in us, a culpability that God has revealed himself to us. Um, and, and if we go back to the very beginning of Scripture, at, at the time when Adam and Eve are in the garden, you see that Adam and Eve are in relationship with God, and in the garden and in that relationship, there is, there is a fellowship that they have. Uh, there is a, a, a relationship where they're together, where God walks in the garden in the afternoon in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. And so there's a direct knowledge, an unhindered fellowship that's there. Um, but Paul speaks of that here in this sense of now being broken and being over. Uh, he refers to man as... Uh, spiritually dead and no longer in fellowship but separated from God and now he's walking in unrighteousness walking in ungodliness um, what is the outcome of that that our wills because of this fall into sin that the will of man and really that's what he's doing is paint a picture of what, what, what has happened as a result of that fall when Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord were kicked out of the garden he's painting that picture and he's saying the will of man has become rebellious. Our understanding has become clouded. Our affections have become distorted. And so fallen people suppress the truth. They attempt to hinder the truth by their wickedness. I don't know about you, but I don't think about my sin that way. I don't think about my sin as, a, as an effort to suppress the truth about God. But in, in essence, it does. You know, it, it certainly shows my unbelief. And, and reflects the nature of my, my fallen heart. But it also keeps me from reflecting the glory of God in my life. Just the opposite is seen in me. Instead of God's glory, my sin becomes apparent. And the truth about God is sort of hidden as a result of that. And sometimes, again, this is a conscious thing that people do. I, I, I think of all the wrestling that goes on in our day scientifically in the in the community that seeks to put away any knowledge of God, will not even a priori think about intelligent design and those types of things. We will not consider those things. But at the same time, there is this process in our lives where we're hiding the glory of God because of sin. And it's not seen in us the way it should be. We were created in the image of God. And so the glory of God ought to be seen in us and in our lives. 
is one of the things that happens to us as a part of the gospel, that God's remaking that image, that more and more we would reflect that glory. But here he's saying, no, in a sense, um, because of the fall, our wills are rebellious, our understanding is clouded, our affections are distorted, and we suppress the truth. Now, the, the, the thing about this passage that is, is so unique here is that it's clear from what Paul is saying that God makes himself known to us. Even in the middle of this condition, this fallen condition, God makes himself known. What can be known about him is plain, it says. Um, if we would only contemplate and examine creation, People would be able to discern God's qualities. They could see and understand His hidden power. Uh, and that's, the term here that's used kind of refers to the vast sum of God's perfections, of His nature and character. And Paul is saying those things, though not everything can be known by sinful men, a lot can be known. Those things are clear. And there's a culpability for us when we don't understand those things and acknowledge those things. Um, you know some of these arguments, that even the argument that, um, you know, if you look at a painting, you understand simply by looking at the painting that there must be a painter. And so by looking at creation, just through common revelation that God has given all men, it is clear that there is a God, and there are things about Him that can be clearly understood. And so the Scriptures tell us that we are intellectually aware, that we have a knowledge, or had a knowledge, um, and that some things about God can be really known through scientific inquiry, through study, through examination. Um, okay. So this is the indictment here, that even with this knowledge, even with this knowledge that God has made clear and God has made plain, we, we, we can't, in a sense, plead that you didn't show me, you, you didn't help me see this, God. This is your fault for lack of, of revelation. God says, no, it, it's been plain and clear. You should know this. You should understand. And so the indictment is that we suppress that truth. The truth is there. The truth is discernible. But we suppress that truth as men. Um, it's interesting because the word suppress here, catechine, um, in the Greek means to push against. I, I read something where someone says, like, pressing down on a spring. You know, there's a... There's a, a, an effort made to push back and to, to repress. It's like repressed memories. It's still the same idea. They're pushed into the back of the mind actively um, to get them out of our mind. Um, there's a hindering of that knowledge. So the truth is stifled. The truth is repressed and pushed down. That's the indictment. And the verdict in this passage, Paul says, is you're without excuse. Um, it's willful denial suppression, distortion, rejection of the truth that God has made plain to all men. And that's a sobering thought if you think about it, that that's where all men stand. You know, it, it, I remember years ago one of the big questions people would ask, well, what about the poor, innocent person, you know, in some third world country that's never heard of Jesus? Well, clearly, God does not judge men for what they don't and haven't heard. But there is, in this passage, taught very clearly there's no such thing as the poor, innocent person. That all men have been given this knowledge, no matter where they are. They may not know Jesus by name, but they know something of God, and they know something of His character and attributes. And they nevertheless, culpable, suppress that knowledge. So men are without excuse. So people distort the original knowledge of God. That's the first reason. The second reason that we see here is that um, they turn from the true God to false gods of their own making. That people turn from the true God to false gods of their own making. We're looking at verses 21 to 23 here, that one paragraph. Um, Notice that, again, ignorance is not the sin. It's not an intellectual problem here that we're dealing with. What we're dealing with here is a moral problem. It's a problem of the heart. It, it is a problem of the, of, of the inclination. Every inclination of the heart is only evil all the time, and as we read back in Genesis during the time of Noah. The same is true with the hearts of men today. 
there's a sense that, that this is a moral issue and that this is a worship issue. It's what we worship that is the problem. And maybe you've heard, heard it said that all men are created to be worshipers. And so if we don't worship the true God, we will worship a false God. But we will all worship something. And that's sort of the, the truth of this passage in a sense as he talks about this. Um, there is a, a, a sense where ignorance again is not the sin. Sproul said that the primordial sin of mankind um, is the sin of, of, of not giving him glory and honor as God. Did you see that in verse 21? For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. They didn't honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. And what's the result of that? It impacts us. It impacts our hearts and our minds. Um, this moral bias that's there. It says our thinking becomes futile. When we think about that, it means pointless. It means silly, stupid. You know, choosing to remain in darkness, there is literally an intellectual dishonesty that kind of breeds in us as a part of this. And we can pose all kinds of systems of thought that oppose God and deny Him. But it moves from the intellect, and he says that their foolish hearts are darkened. Their thinking is futile, their foolish hearts are darkened. Their entire personality, the mind, the will, the emotions... All of those things become unintelligent because of this spiritual uh, deadness that's there. There's now ignorance, maliciousness, an active rebellion that is taking place in the heart of man. And he says, claiming to be wise, we've become fools. It, it, it's interesting that we profess wisdom but possess foolishness. Um, I, I think of Again, going back to just our intellectual discussions uh, in our time about the existence of God and, and how we put faith in the scientific community as opposed to the Word of God and what it teaches. And you go to the scientific community, and this is exactly what's being exhibited. And we will not even consider the truth of an intelligent desire. We will not consider that reality. There's an arrogance to that thought. Of this cannot possibly be true, as, as the truth that God has made clear is being suppressed and pushed down. It's interesting because it leads to all kinds of things. It leads to all kinds of false religions, whether that be science and secularism that a lot of people embrace, or, or whether it be sort of false religions of other kinds. Um, Roy noted that in ancient empires, that in Egypt, China, Babylonia, Persia, Greece, and Rome, um, th their civilizations are rife with different types of superstitions. Um, and many non-Christian religions are, are superstitious in nature. We have left true wisdom. We have left true wisdom when we live, leave the God of Scripture. Um, I, I'm reminded uh, in, in Psalm 110, as well as in Proverbs 1, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so how can there be wisdom when we suppress the truth about God? Wisdom begins when the heart is disposed to adore and revere God. And so that's where true wisdom is to be found. And far from this type of evolutionary movement in religion, or religious progression as it's called, there's a deteriorization that takes place as we move from a belief in the one true God into all kinds of other religions of our own making. We, we substitute these. And as he goes on to say, you know, we worship something else, images of people, birds, reptiles, gods that we can manipulate. Sometimes it's just self, you know, in the things that make us comfortable, that put us at ease, whether that's prosperity, whether that's comfort. It's a, a lot of our religion is self-oriented, self-aggrandizement, self-fulfillment. You know, any time we take the truth and, and twist it and turn it in some way to fit our own likings, we are being idolatrous as people. And we can do that even in Christianity. You've probably heard of the, those a few years ago that met um, to reimagine Christianity. We're not to reimagine God. We don't choose a God of our own liking, our own making, and worship that God. We are to worship the God of Scripture, the God of history. 
So what happens is we, we turn from the true God to false gods of our own making. But God judges idolatry. And all those who exchange the truth of God for a lie are judged clearly in this passage. Okay. So we turn from true gods to false religion. Thirdly, the third reason we see here is that um, our idolatry degenerates into self-indulgent immorality. It degenerates into immorality. You know, idolatry inevitably leads to immorality. I don't know if you've thought about that, but it seems to be the pattern of it wherever we see it in the world is whatever we're idolizing, it leads to that. And even in our own hearts, the worship of self is going to lead slowly to immorality as well. Um, it was part of all the pagan religions of the past in history. Um, you might remember Baal and, and um, all these other pagan religions were sort of fertility cults. And, and their, their worship ended up leading to immorality. Um, and part of those things were heterosexual, homosexual prostitution. That was part of what was going on in the temple. Uh, as people were physically involved, what they were, at least as I understand it, what they were trying to do is, is to encourage the gods to become physically involved. And if the gods would become physically uh, involved, whether it's promiscuously or however their system was set up, that activity in the heavens brought rains and, br and brought the crops and brought prosperity to people. That was their view. So worship sort of degenerated into immorality. Um, and what is God's response to that? I'm in 24 through 27 right now, verses 24 through 27. And notice he says, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to dishonor, the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. And so in the lusts of their heart, they're given over to sexual immorality. As I was looking at this passage last night, and I was reading something that Sproul had written about this, and he says, this is poetic justice, in a sense, of what's taking place here. Because what happens is, we are given over to the very things we long for. You know, the best thing that can happen for us in our lives is for God to, to keep us from the things that we long for. And yet, we're given over to those very things. And so this divine law of sowing and reaping that we will reap what we sow. That divine law is in place. Um, and so God allows people to indulge their passions for a time. But there's a slavery to sin. If we talk about judgment again in the here and now, the providential judgment, there's a slavery to sin. There's a shackling that begins to take place to people as they move down um, this, this line of being given over. And there's, of course, the eschatological or the judgment in the future to come as well. Um, and all of this because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. I mean, imagine that. We, we, would, we would never do that, right? And yet he, Paul says this is exactly what we have done as people, all people, has, have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Um, and so God has given us up. And in verses 26 and 27 here, you will see that he, he gives them up to dishonorable passions, but then he gives them up as well um, to homosexual passions, male and male, female and female sins. Um, Roy points out here that, that maybe women are mentioned first in this passage because they are, in a sense, moral barometers of a society. And so he deals with lesbian behavior at the beginning of this, depicting the, the degree of degradation that begins to take place in the culture. Um, and notice as well that um, male homosexual acts are called shameless in this passage. You would be amazed at what some people have written um, trying to unpack and unfold this passage, especially in t today's world. As you know, um, this is a huge issue right now in our culture of trying to get our arms around this. And there are homosexual theologians that have taken this passage down, deconstructed it to show that homosexuality is not a sin. Um, there are those that have taken the passage of Sodom and Gomorrah and said, you know, the real sin there is a lack of hospitality. <laughs> you know, the men had come into town for the night and had no place to stay. 
But an honest reading of any of these passages is clear about what is true. Um, and let me say this, Dr. Taylor's going to devote the class next week, the entire class, to this issue and go into some depth. So if you want more, come back next week and you'll get much more on this. But, but it ought to be clear in this passage. Now in our Bibles it says men and women, but you know in the Greek it says male and female. The terms are changed. And, and so that we understand here, it seems like translations want to go and, and to say men and women. But he uses the terms male and female here to emphasize the physical aspect of the behavior and of what's going on here. And that that physical aspect is contrary to nature. I don't know how it can be more clear here. Um, now certainly he's not referring to, and, and we have to struggle with this issue. The Bible doesn't kind of divide between homosexual orientation and homosexual practice. But I think we as believers understand from um, 1 Corinthians 10 that, that there's no temptation that sees this, that it's not common to man. Some people are tempted more strongly in one area and other people are tempted more strongly in another area. I have my temptations, you have yours. We all have the same temptations, but each of us are going to have them differently depending on, on how we're made. But here, certainly, the focus is on not an orientation or a temptation, but more on practice in the physical aspects of this. It is the homosexual act which is sin here. And it is clearly considered unnatural, in other words, not according to God's design. Jesus was very clear about that as well when he taught on this passage. Um, the, he, he reiterated Genesis that you know, uh, marriage is supposed to be between a man and a woman and goes on to even warn anyone from getting in the way of that. Um, but here we see that, um, again, this is a dishonorable act and against God's design. And I'll, I'll let Roy come back and teach more of this um, next week. But it, this idolatry um, that is taking place in this passage, it degenerates into immorality. That was our third point. Our, our last point, our fourth point here, um, is that... Sinners are without excuse and in need of the Lord Jesus because they justify their impenitence, their unwillingness to repent, and they delight in their sin, and they develop it. Talk about a progression. Here's where we see a progression. You know, one would think, and, and, and logic would sort of dictate, that if you're under the judgment of God and the wrath of God is being revealed in your life and you're shackled by sin, that you would turn from that, Right? The suffering of that, the consequences of that in your life, that you would turn from it and turn to God. But it seems like just the opposite is true here. It's amazing. God clearly gives them over to a debased mind. And their thinking becomes twisted. Their thought processes are completely upside down here. Um, it even defies human self-preservation, what is taking place in people's lives. They begin to call good evil and evil good. They attempt to justify sin in different ways. And instead of fleeing to God, they flee from God. And so we see here again that they delight in this and seek to justify this sin. Again, I'm in verses 28 to 32, the last paragraph here. Um, this didn't happen because of a lack of opportunity. This did not happen because of a lack of knowledge, because of a lack of God's revelation or because of a lack of man's perception or ability to perceive. It is a deliberate refusal to acknowledge God. As Leon Morris puts it, they preferred other things to the knowledge of God. And this is the case that Paul's making here. That we prefer other things and delight in other things rather than the glory of God and the knowledge of God. As another commentator put it, men did not see any purpose in pursuing a knowledge of God in any kind of depth. The depth we could have pursued that knowledge. Or even maintaining with any serious depth the knowledge that God had already given. And so now, this process of judgment because of the wrath of God being revealed and being poured out from heaven begins to happen. <clears throat> in dehumanizing sin, demeaning, debasing sensual sins now sort of climax the day in verses 24 to 27. But notice he even adds to that now when we're down in verses 20 
9 to 31, there are 24 antisocial sins in four different groupings here. Unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, another word for that in some translations is just evil. Gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, in a phrase that just makes me shudder, which is inventors of evil. We're creative in this. Think of being made in the image of God, our creator, and yet we're creative in inventing evil. Disobedient to parents, the whole order of authority is destroyed, and it leads to foolishness, faithlessness, heartlessness, ruthlessness, even though God's righteous decree about this is known, God makes that clear that those who practice these types of sins deserve God's judgment. They nevertheless continue Yes, There's a downward spiral, isn't there, in all of this. Um, and the last part of this makes us shudder even more. That if it's not bad enough that we are involved in this, we encourage one another to be involved in this. We applaud one another. And when you look at this passage and you step back at this whole passage, there's very little like it in Scripture. Um, there are pieces of it. Paul gathers some of this and some of the summary statements of this. He pulls them together in Romans 3 that we'll see in just a second. But he, I don't think there's a passage anywhere in the Bible that is more reprehensible, deplorable, disgraceful, shameful, dishonorable, repugnant, indefensible, unjustifiable, or inexcusable than the state of man in this fallen world. The condition of man and the condition of our hearts and our minds. This is biblical anthropology. This is truth about who we are. And we may not want to admit that, but this is true. And for this reason, we need a Savior. And you know, it doesn't matter how many times you tell somebody that they need a Savior, they will never appreciate that until they understand this. Do you understand the nature of your own heart and where you are and where I am? You will never appreciate the gospel. And what Paul is doing is he's laying the groundwork for this wonderful truth of justification by faith. Because who can work themselves out of this? Who can accomplish anything like this? I mean, all we're doing is bringing dishonor to the Lord and spiraling downward. But it is in this condition that God so loves the world. Isn't that amazing? We talk about amazing grace. This brings about the coming of Christ. Uh, it's, initi it's interesting to me what Paul does. Let me just walk through a couple of quick verses showing you the progression of Paul from this truth. He, he goes to, to Romans 3.10 where he says it's written, and he can, he's pulling from the Psalms, from Proverbs, from Isaiah. And he says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one is understa understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside, and together they've become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. And he goes on to develop that for a few passages there, and then he comes down to the gospel. And he says, but now, and this is in verse 20 run of Romans 3, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all. Why? Because all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And he goes on to say that all who are justified are justified by His grace as a gift. I mean, isn't that the truth of the gospel that comes to bear on this? It has to be a gift when you look at who we are and what is true about our hearts and minds. Um, and then he goes on, you know, even Christians struggling in sin. Um, they cry out, as Paul does here, you know, who will, the wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in that great passage in um, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Without excuse, the gospel of Christ It is laid on Jesus. The wrath of God is laid on Him. 
difficult passage, but a wonderful progression to the gospel, is it not? That we understand this truth. Thoughts, questions? I find it uh, interesting in, in the last slide, um, the first point, the male and the female, Paul uses that with this big thing with um, gender today. I, I, I heard it on, oh, it was this morning coming in. I was listening to the radio, and it was a good, succinct statement. I didn't agree with it, but it was good and succinct. It basically said that uh, gender is a social construct. And so, not male and female. Not male afraid. and female. Yeah, Romans, yeah. I mean, Genesis one twenty six. Right. There's a complete denial, suppression of the truth is taking place in our culture. Our culture is at war with this truth. Now, I guess y'all understand that clearly. It is at war with this truth. Men are basically good. That's what we're saying. They've evolved, and they're not as good as they could be, but they've become better. And the scriptures say no. They they have. Though created in the image of God, where there's great dignity and equality between men and women in that sense, equal dignity, different, but equal dignity. And the culture says, no, no, it is not. And it's true everywhere. It's true in everything in academia. It's true in politics. It's true everywhere. There's a different view of man at play. And it doesn't bode well for us. It is. It's written to all people. It is written to all people. Um, certainly, those who have come to know Christ, who have, have regenerate hearts in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, that God is remaking His image in them. But thence comes the war of Romans 7 and the battle of my flesh versus the Spirit and, and the back and forth, because it's still there, isn't it? He hasn't... He hasn't fully redeemed us from this reality yet, even in our own hearts and lives. And so we're to guard our hearts and we're to walk in the Spirit and we're to be concerned and careful about this issue. We, we cannot trust ourselves. But yes, right. it's true of all men everywhere, Jews and Gentiles. I kind of picked that up from yeah. chapter 2 where it says, You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do Exactly. I kind of got that even, we just, we can't even, we can't judge others that are in this place because right. we have the same right. sort of struggles. Not, not in a condescending, ju judgmental sort right. of way. That, that, right. is, that is right. That our approach to other people has to be one of humility, right. not finger pointing, right. but humility because this is true of our own hearts and minds as well. Right. War of this makes us tremble and are so, makes us so thankful. Amen. And that, that ought to totally um, change the way that we approach people with the gospel. It really ought to. Okay, guys, it's getting late. It's about 10 till, so um, let's end. And, and let me just close this quickly in prayer. Father, help us to understand these truths uh, and to hold them rightly, as we were just talking about, in great humility. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the work of, of Christ and for sending him forth. Lord, your people should never tire of, of praise and thanksgiving for the gospel alone. So be with us now. Prepare our hearts as we go to worship. For we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys.